I'm Eddie Muller, and right now, Noir Alley intersects with Mystery Street, a film featuring several exceptional talents before and behind the camera, including the great visionary of film noir, cinematographer John Alton. Now, despite Alton's imagery, this MGM production released in 1950 is actually less of a film noir than it is an early example of a police procedural. Think Naked City with microscopes. You could call this the great granddaddy of all the forensics-based crime shows cluttering up contemporary television. But it's important to realize that the investigative work you'll see in this film was brand new stuff when the film was being made. Few people watching Mystery Street in its original release had any idea about DNA. The forensics files, CSI, Peoria, and all the rest were still decades away. Some of the material in this film is so sordid, I'm amazed it got past the censors at the production code office. Those guys still wanted people to believe babies were delivered by magical storks. The excellent script, based on a story by Leonard Spiegelgast, revolves around a pregnant but unmarried woman, played by the always terrific Jan Sterling, and the horrors that ensue when she blackmails her lover, a married Boston Brahmin, into paying for her abortion. Daring stuff for a film of this era. Nothing to say. Go on, make a speech. You're pretty good at that. You're pretty good at everything except paying off, aren't you? The final script was a collaboration between two guys who in only a few short years left an indelible mark on noir, former newspaper men Richard Brooks and Sidney Boehm. In addition to writing the novel that became Crossfire, Brooks worked on The Killers, Brute Force, and Key Largo, while Boehm had penned, to date, High Wall, Side Street, The Undercover Man, and Union Station. And true to their roots as reporters, Brooks and Boehm relished the chance to write a realistic crime picture, one that doggedly followed leads step by step to solve a seemingly unsolvable crime. Now, as an extra surprise, the dogged flatfoot who digs into the lives of these affluent blue bloods is Hispanic, a cop named Pete Morales, which makes for some pointed class commentary amid all the lurid forensic detail. Ricardo Montalban had become a major star in Mexico in the 1940s, and MGM brought him to Hollywood almost as an experiment to see if he could crack the ranks of top male movie stars. You stripped the body, threw it behind some bushes, then you got rid of your car so you could say it was stolen. I tell you, she took my car. I thought you said you didn't know who took your car. At first, he mostly played Latin lovers in Esther Williams musicals. You know the classic song, Baby, It's Cold Outside? Montalban introduced that song, singing it to Esther Williams in Neptune's Daughter. But here, in his second top-billed role at the studio, Montalban doesn't sing or dance, but he does show another side to the talent and charisma that earned him a long career in American movies and television. This role could just as easily have been played by some other MGM leading man, like Van Johnson. But credit Dory Sherry and first-time producer Frank Taylor for deciding to have the script tailored to their Mexico City-born leading man. Originally, Sherry wanted Joseph Losey to direct the film. They'd worked together at RKO on The Boy with the Green Hair, a parable about the mistreatment of refugees. But before shooting could begin, Losey's left-wing politics made him a target of the anti-communist brigade in Washington, and the money men at MGM declared him persona non grata at the studio. Now, for a hot minute, the producers considered giving film editor Harold Kress his first feature directing job, until they learned that John Sturgis was available. Now, Sturgis had a few years' worth of sturdy B pictures under his belt, earning a reputation for efficiency and economy. Now, his reputation as a great action director was still to come, with popular hits like The Magnificent Seven and The Great Escape. On this project, Sturgis had a secret weapon, John Alton, whose brilliant camera work could raise even the most mediocre melodrama to the level of photographic art. Now, much of the film was shot on location in and around Boston and nearby Harvard University. In fact, that's where the idea was born 
when Leonard Spiegelgas, on a routine scouting expedition for the studio, discovered the school's Department of Legal Medicine, which often worked on cases with the Boston police. In fact, the film was originally entitled Murder at Harvard. Coincidentally, John Alton was the DP on another film released in 1948, which also focused on forensic crime solving. He walked by night. Now, whether he was working on location or in a studio, composing long shots of stately structures or dramatic close-ups of actors' faces, John Alton got maximum impact from every image. As evidence, I present Exhibit A from 1950, an Oscar nominee for that year's best screen story. Here is Mystery Street. <laughs> 